in this slide you see an overview. This is Mark Levine from the National Institutes of Health. The National Institutes of Health in the United States is a special place where translational science can proceed. The National Institutes of Health is a 300 plus acre campus in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. In this slide, you see an overview of the entire campus with the hospital, the, the largest building in the photograph. We at the National Institutes of Health are the largest hospital in the world whose dedication is specifically to clinical research. We do not have an emergency room. We certainly take care of patients who become sick, but every patient who comes to the National Institutes of Health is part of a clinical research protocol. Here is a picture of both the old and the new hospital. The old hospital is the larger brick, back, brick building in the background, and the new hospital is in the foreground. The vitamin C studies I'm going to tell you about were done in the older brick building, and current studies continue with vitamin C in diabetes and with vitamin E in the new building in the, in the foreground. The hospital currently has 240 beds. Um, there's close proximity to research labs. As I said, every patient who comes has to be part of a research protocol. Our care at the National Institutes of Health is free. It, this is really a wonderful environment, ideal environment for bench to bedside research and how I was able to conduct the studies that I'm going to tell you about. Here's a picture of the atrium of the hospital. The hospital is designed to be very patient friendly and to be a warm environment. In this slide that's coming, here is a typical patient room. and In fact, we use this very room for some of our ongoing vitamin E pharmacokinetic studies in patients. So with this wonderful environment that I've been very fortunate to be part of, I'm going to tell you about studies about vitamin C from recommended intake um, that evolved to cancer treatment. Why study, why study vitamins? Um, vitamins have the potential, if we know what is ideal, to optimize health and prevent disease. But that's if we know what's the ideal or optimum amount to consume. Vitamin recommendations, unfortunately for many vitamins, are still based on preventing deficiency with an arbitrary margin of safety. Vitamin recommendations are, not, are usually not based on vitamin function, and for most vitamins, there are not criteria for ideal ingestion. One can think of how to get to this place of optimum vitamin concentration or vitamin ingestion through this schematic graph. For any vitamin, you can think of an amount on the x-axis, and then the function of that amount of vitamin on the y-axis. In this schematic graph, you see five curves. The intersection line that denotes optimum is where these curves maximize without fall off or toxicity. So that, as, as you see, the vertical line would be, an, would be an indication of what would be the concentration that would be optimum. Uh, this scheme is a concentration function scheme. It is based on thinking about optimal vitamin recommendations based on what vitamins do. So to validate this idea, I selected a vitamin arbitrarily, which is ascorbic acid or vitamin C. In this slide, uh, you see an example of vitamin C concentration on the x-axis and its function in C2 in the adrenal glands of animals, of cows, on the y-axis. And what you're looking at is norepinephrine biosynthesis as a function of ascorbic acid concentration. The endogenous concentration in the adrenal gland is about 10 to 12 millimolar. In other words, uh, this particular reaction uh, proceeds at top speed in the adrenal gland, and the insets are kinetics. What this slide tells us is that it is possible to, to, to perform kinetics in C2 
or concentra or to or to derive concentration function uh, relationships what is what is uh, worth noting about uh, these experiments is that the way vitamin C worked in C2 um, was different than the way vitamin C works for the isolated enzyme, which is required to make norepinephrine from dopamine. So in C2 matters, uh, concentration function relationships matter. These, these uh, schemes that I showed you, where this scheme was for vitamin C uh, reaction in an animal. Um, I am a clinician at heart and by training as well as a basic scientist. And my goal is to learn how much vitamin C is necessary in patients for, in people, for these reactions, these kinds of reactions to occur. What this means is it's essential to know what the x-axis is or vitamin C concentrations are in people in order to go forward about function. To learn vitamin C concentrations in people is a straightforward idea but in fact, in practice, is very difficult to do. This is pharmacokinetics, and it had not been done previously for any vitamin. We did this using a classical uh, uh, nutritional sciences design of a depletion-repletion study. This is to take away the vitamin, let concentrations fall to a low but safe place, and then replace the vitamin in graded steps with following strict pharmacokinetics principles. We had to develop an assay to do this. We also had to design a diet um, that allowed people to stay in the hospital for long periods of time, yet would deplete the vitamin and also was something that people would eat. These experiments were done on uh, healthy people under the age of 30, and they ended up staying in the hospital as my patients for about six months each. These experiments took about 10 years to do in healthy men and women. In this slide is a summary slide of the findings of different doses shown on the x-axis versus steady state plasma concentrations. These are shown on the y-axis. The dotted line indicates what, what people would get if they consumed an average or ate an average of five servings of fruits and vegetables a day fruits and vegetables contain vitamin C. What these data show you is that at very low doses, healthy humans work hard to bring vitamin C concentrations to about 70 to 80 micromolar. But after about 200 milligrams, very little happens. The open symbols are men. The closed symbols are women. So men and women behave similarly. We call this, this relationship of dose to achieve plasma concentration tight control because after a couple of hundred milligrams there's very little change in plasma values. This is also true for tissues. This information is very useful for making dietary recommendations. This information is used in the United States and Canada, in fact, and in many countries for deriving recommended dietary allowances. Different countries interpret the data uh, slightly differently, but the bottom line is this this information is very valuable to determine a recommended dietary intake. It's a pharmacokinetics approach. Now there there are some very interesting issues that come from the data that you saw, and those uh, issues really are about a simple question. That question is what is responsible for the tight control of vitamin C concentrations? that we saw. There are four obvious explanations. They are how the vitamin is absorbed once it's ingested, how it is transported into different tissues, how it is handled in blood and filtered by the kidney, and how the material is used. And each of these um, possibilities to explain tight control has been the subject of a lot of work by my laboratory and other laboratories, too. I want to focus on absorption. And I want to show you specifically some data of higher doses of vitamin C that were given to healthy women. The pink line in this graph shows oral vitamin C that was given at time zero. 
What the data shows you is that what the data show is that plasma concentrations on the y-axis rise to an average of about 150 micromolar or so by about three to four hours, and then the concentrations fall back down by about 12 hours to baseline, which was around 80 micromolar. When I gave that same dose to people intravenously, the concentrations were much higher. They were oh, up to a millimolar or so, or 1,000 micromolar on the y-axis, and they too fell back to the basal values, and that is uh, because of of the kidney restoring homeostasis data that I'm not showing you, but is the answer as to what one of the ways that vitamin C is tightly controlled. What this what this tells us is that intravenous vitamin C administration um, of doses above maybe two or three or four hundred milligrams. Uh, can provide plasma concentrations that are much, much higher than you would get from oral ingestion, which I'm showing you again here. And with oral ingestion, uh, doses of, of uh, 1,200 milligrams or 1,000 milligrams would not give you a value above 80 micromolar at the steady state fasting place. So IV ascorbic acid is a drug. Who cares? Well, it turns out that I care, and I hope that I can convince you that we should care about administration of IV ascorbic acid as a drug. Um, the history matters. Um, past as prologue is a valuable saying here. Um, vitamin C had been proposed to be useful in cancer treatment, oh, more than 60 years ago, with a very simple idea, and that was that vitamin C would strengthen collagen and prevent tumors from metastasizing by making collagen stronger. There was minimal or no evidence for this. You and Cameron extended this idea uh, based on very simple in vitro experiments in the late 1960s, suggesting that high dose, high amounts or high concentrations of vitamin C would prevent, uh, would, would block the enzyme that would break down collagen. So you and Cameron, a clinician in Scotland, began giving uh, high doses of vitamin C to patients with terminal cancer. High doses mean 10,000 milligrams or 10 grams a day compared to the 200 milligrams that I showed you that causes plasma concentrations to reach um, a plateau when, when these doses are given orally. At, at that time, Linus Pauling, the chemist who won two Nobel Prizes by himself, um, was interested in vitamin C in the common cold and had been quite active in the press about whether this was useful. And Cameron wrote to Pauling. There was no internet at that time. It was just correspondence and explained to Pauling his, his uh, interest and uh, evidence with clinical cases. Pauling was very excited. And together, um, Cameron uh, compiled and published with Pauling two case series showing that 10 grams of vitamin C given to patients with terminal cancer produced some unusual responses, prolonged life in some people in a very unexpected way. Pauling became very vocal that vitamin C was useful in treating cancer um, and uh, claim that people like me were part of the medical industrial complex and were blocking this kind of work. Now, I was just a medical student at the time, but Charles Martell at the Mayo Clinic, an investigator, um, rose to Pauling's challenge and said, let's do double-blind trials to test whether high-dose vitamin C has any effect in cancer treatment. And both trials uh, showed no effect at all of 10 grams of vitamin C. And these were both double-blind placebo-controlled trials published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, this, by this time, it's 1985, and the National Cancer Institute here in the United States said there's no evidence that this is useful, and let's just discard this idea. Um, now we can fast forward to the clinical data that I showed you. And we can remember that IV and oral ascorbic acid are different. Um, no one knew that. The doses that were administered by um, Cameron 
in Scotland were both intravenous and oral. The doses administered at the Mayo Clinic were oral only. Nobody knew the difference. We had these data that said intravenous and oral vitamin C um, can be very different. You, the way to think about this, if there are clinicians listening to this, is about intravenous use versus oral use of antibiotics and many other drugs for that matter, that intravenous use often provides higher plasma concentrations based on bypassing absorption in the gut. So one of the first steps about this was to consider how and if intravenous dosing could produce concentrations that were high meaning several hundredfold higher than could ever be achieved by mouth. And we were able to model data that is shown here. Um, and the doses that we picked were doses that were used by uh, integrative medicine or alternative medicine practitioners who were still giving IV ascorbic acid to patients for a variety of reasons. And these data uh, show you that when ascorbic acid is in administered intravenously, that plasma concentrations as high as 15 millimolar should be achievable. That is what is shown by the different curves. On the x-axis is time. On the y-axis is the plasma concentration. The pink line is the amount that would be found in plasma with the maximally tolerated oral dose of about 18 grams a day. And in fact, this was verified uh, later to be correct. In fact, both ideas were verified later to be correct. Uh, this, the data on this slide are an example of giving ascorbic acid intravenously to patients with cancer and measuring plasma concentrations after the ascorbic acid was administered. And plasma concentrations, in fact, that were achieved were higher than what we estimated would occur uh, concentrations as high as 25 millimoles per liter could be achieved um, with oral with IV ascorbic acid dosing. And again, uh, oral ascorbic acid uh, dosing simply could not achieve concentrations above 200 micromolar because of the tight control mechanisms that I showed you. So intravenous ascorbic acid seems to be a drug. Um, now. We can proceed in several different ways, but I'm going to tell you the way that I proceeded. And the way that I thought about this was not about mechanism first. I told you that I'm a clinician, and I thought about safety. Um, and that safety means that if it were not safe to give this material to people, and if there were evidence already that there was not safety, then that was a big red stop sign for me. But there was evidence about safety because, as I mentioned, integrative medicine or alternative medicine, complementary alternative medicine practitioners had been using ascorbic acid under the radar for years. And we documented this use in the United States. Um, the amount of use of ascorbic acid intravenously is surprisingly large. And I'm, I'm going to guess that in Korea it's also surprisingly large. And the adverse events are very few as long as patients are screened properly for renal function, glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase deficiency. So with this safety information um, in mind and so suggestive, it was worthwhile to proceed. And the way to proceed uh, scientifically and mechanistically was to ask, could pharmacologic ascorbic acid concentrations do something to cancer cells without harming normal cells. Pharmacologic ascorbate concentrations would, those be, would be those concentrations that we found in people who were given intravenous ascorbic acid. In this graph, you were looking at the effective concentration of ascorbic acid that in millimolar that kills half of the particular cell. On the y-axis are just many different cell types. Let's start at the top with normal human cells. 
the, 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 the longer the line for each cell, meaning the more to the right the line goes, the more the survival of cells. So all the normal cells don't care about ascorbic acid concentrations as high as 20 millimolar. That's what's shown at the top. If you then look at um, mouse cancer cells, rat cancer cells, and human cancer cells, there are a number of cancer cells from each type that care a lot about ascorbic acid and, in fact, seem to either have growth arrest or to die. And the assay that is used here, the measurement technique, is very simple. It's for growth arrest. It's a, a dye test. It's a, it's a very good screen. It does not provide sensitivity. It has sensitivity. It doesn't tell specific mechanisms, but it's quite a sensitive test, either one, Alamar Blue or MTT. So pharmacologic ascorbic acid kills some cancer cells in concentrations that we can achieve in people. Ascorbic acid in cell culture systems for many years had been noted to produce hydrogen peroxide as an artifact, especially if iron was present in the medium. This was considered to be an annoyance during cell culture, but in fact, this provided a key clue as to what the mechanism of ascorbic acid might be in pharmacologic concentrations. In this slide, we are looking at uh, ascorbic acid that is in pink triangles that is added to cells, um, and the amount of death that occurs on the y-axis, and the amount of peroxide generated by that ascorbic acid uh, is shown on the x-axis. And in fact, the top amount of ascorbic acid here is a millimolar, as a few millimolar, and the, the point is that this ascorbic acid generates the same kind of death as peroxide added directly. So the similar concentrations of peroxide added out of the bottle um, produce death just as pharmacologic ascorbic acid does. So this, these and many other uh, in vitro experiments allowed us to come up with a very simple idea. And that was that pharmacologic ascorbic acid in the extracellular space outside cells would interact with some metal and produce peroxide outside cells. Once there's peroxide outside cells, that peroxide can be damaging by either acting outside of cells on the membrane or diffuse into cells and once inside cells, um, be damaging, and in both cases, this is through generation of reactive oxygen species, which have multiple targets. So you can think of ascorbic acid as a prodrug for hydrogen peroxide formation outside cells. Now, when we had reached this point about 11 or 12 years ago, um, some of my colleagues here at NIH uh, were adamant that the way forward was to test the specific um, mechanisms that would uh, involve inhibiting cell growth, such as damage to DNA transcription or protein translation or to changes in membrane protein. And I was not in favor of proceeding that way for several reasons. One is that, as you saw from the little scheme I showed you, um, uh, peroxide formation would be predicted to be promiscuous. In other words, there would be multiple predicted targets from pharmacologic ascorbic acid. And number two, again, as a clinician, what was most important to me was whether, in fact, peroxide really formed in vivo. If peroxide didn't form and it didn't form in the right place, then again, the idea is not reasonable about pharmacologic ascorbic acid. So we measured whether um, peroxide formed in vivo um, as we thought it would. And the prediction was that, that peroxide would form only in the extracellular space and not in the blood. We were able to test this idea using rats. Oh, I would love to do it in people, and I hope that we can in the next couple of years but rats had to suffice. These rats were given pharmacologic ascorbic acid. We could measure ascorbic acid in blood and extracellular fluid. We could measure the one electron donor species 
uh, after an electron left ascorbic acid, which is a ascorbate radical, and we could measure peroxide. And we were able to validate this concept. Here is one example of many uh, um, types of data that we obtained. And what you're looking at here is ascorbic acid concentrations in the extracellular fluid on the x-axis. On the y-axis is the amount of hydrogen peroxide in that extracellular fluid. When ascorbic acid was given to animals by gavage, we could not find any peroxide. Those are the symbols at the very bottom on the left side. The inset is the amount of peroxide formed in relation to the ascorbic acid plasma concentrations, which is what is a way to measure what we gave the animals, and it's the same kind of relationship. That's because ascorbic acid in the plasma and the extracellular fluid equilibrate. We could also show that hydrogen peroxide forms in tumors. These are in tumor uh, explants, or these are tumors that have been implanted, rather, to nude mice. Um, ascorbic acid is administered to these animals at time zero, and peroxide is measured either in the tumor and the pink line or in the extracellular fluid on the opposite uh, limb of the animal. Those are the blue points. And the, what these data say is that peroxide forms uh, pretty much everywhere. It seems to form in tumors faster but that peroxide concentrations that occur from pharmacologic ascorbic acid are as high as 150 micromolar. So this, this idea is that pharmacologic ascorbic acid is a prodrug for hydrogen uh, peroxide formation specifically in the extracellular fluid. And there is no peroxide formation in blood. We never could find it in blood, even if we added peroxide directly to blood, we could not measure it because blood has so many mechanisms to metabolize peroxide uh, instantly. So pharmacologic ascorbic acid is a prodrug to deliver hydrogen peroxide to the extracellular space. Once it's there, it has the chance for many actions to kill tumor cells. One of the actions that we hypothesized was that peroxide could in fact decrease ATP. It could do that by several mechanisms, either by increasing PARP or by damaging mitochondria. But this is one of many, many possibilities. Uh, pharmacologic ascorbic acid indeed, and it's shown here that pharmacologic ascorbic acid could have this, the effect I just described on changing ATP. But there are many, many other pathways that have the potential to be affected by generation of extracellular peroxide. Pharmacologic ascorbic acid, in fact, you can think of as a promiscuous uh, peroxide generating agent. Once there's peroxide, the potential mechanisms of action are many. And this is advantageous um, to treating cancer, extremely advantageous. Now, one of the next ways forward, again, could be mechanism. But once again, as a clinician, I did not think that was the right way. And instead, I was driven by patient data. And I'm going to show you briefly some patient data. This is a PET scan on a patient um, who had pancreatic cancer. At the top is the head, which is in black. At the bottom of the slide is the bladder in black. But in the middle, of this slide is a very big black dot which should not be there. That is this patient's pancreatic cancer. And there are other dots to the left at about 9 o'clock, which are metastases to the liver. These metastases to the liver are shown on this slice a CT scan. The yellow dots should not be there. And the patient's um, undifferentiated carcinoma is shown here at the head of the pancreas. This patient received ascorbic acid for a number of years. In fact, we've just reported him. And um, this is his scans two years later. First of all, most patients with this tumor don't live more than three months. This is two years later. His liver is clean. The tumor is present in the pancreas. It is smaller. It is in the middle of the slide. Also, 
the liver CAT scan shows that the patient's metastases have gone away. The patient's CAT scan of his pancreas shows the tumor is present, but it is smaller. And I show you this because this was a driver for how to proceed. Rather than pick pancreatic cancer for mechanism reasons, pancreatic cancer was picked by me as a way forward because there was uh, this canary in the mind, this evidence that maybe there were people who would respond. And also, unfortunately, we could see responses. This kind of cancer is um, lethal to many people. With metastases, average survival is still measured in months. And this is very bad for patients, but it meant this was a place where maybe we would be able to see something with pharmacologic ascorbic acid. It certainly was helpful that many cancer cells were, were susceptible to pharmacologic ascorbic acid. In this slide, you're now looking at um, animals that had tumors implanted and were treated uh, with ascorbic acid in red. There is a clear response of these aggressive tumors, uh, both on volume and weight of the tumors when the animals are sacrificed. Um, here's another experiment from another group showing something similar. The treated animals are in black on this slide. Um, cells that are incubated with ascorbic acid um, uh, in this experiment were also incubated with chemotherapy used for pancreatic cancer, which is gemcitabine. And the point of this slide is that ascorbic acid would be used clinically in combination with other drugs. So we tested whether its use in combination with gemcitabine would have additive effects, harmful effects, or synergistic effects. And what we see is synergy. So the combination of ascorbic acid with gemcitabine is the red curve at the very left. Ascorbic acid alone is the right black curve, and gemcitabine alone are the open squares. And we saw this shift of sensitivity when we combined both agents for every cell line that we studied. And that is shown here. I, I know that it's hard to see these data, but what you want to look at is the red lines. And the red lines are to the left in every one of these graphs. When we conducted an animal experiment, we found for a resistant cancer to gemcitabine that ascorbic acid with gemcitabine uh, created slower tumor growth. Those are the red lines that are shown in each of these graphs. So there is synergy in an animal model, too. But the most important way forward is to put this in patients. And here are data from nine patients who received pharmacologic ascorbic acid with gemcitabine and erlotinib. What is being imaged, or what is being shown here, is the size of their tumors uh, before and after eight weeks of ascorbic acid treatment. Every one of these patients has a reduction in tumor size. There's one exception who had no change. Um, but nobody increased. And this was quite surprising for as short a period of time as eight weeks. It would not be expected with chemotherapy alone. Um, clinical studies by Joe Cullen and his colleagues at the University of Iowa have taken these findings forward. And in a very small series of patients, they were able to show that um, progression-free survival tripled when ascorbic acid was added to gemcitabine and survival uh, more than doubled. Now, there are many weaknesses with these kinds of studies, um, particularly that the numbers are small and the controls are retrospective. But these are very encouraging. These kinds of studies indicate a way forward with people. Meanwhile, other groups have been very interested in the mechanism of how pharmacologic ascorbate worked. And as you would predict, if this agent were a promiscuous actor, there would be multiple intracellular targets. And that's exactly what has been found. It is not surprising. It is a potential advantage of pharmacologic ascorbic acid, multiple potential intracellular targets, all generated because of hydrogen peroxide in the extracellular space. Clinically, um, this kind of effect of ascorbic acid is not uh, limited just to pancreatic cancer. This is a case we recently reported of a man with 
um, metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma, the metastases is to the rib with the imaging nice uh, orange arrow so that you can see it. And at the second cycle, which is 16 uh, weeks uh, after treatment or during treatment, uh, the, this metastasis shrinks over 80%. And this is unheard of for metastatic hepatocellular carcinoma. This patient was treated just as you would would expect to use ascorbic acid, uh, meaning he received uh, serafinib, which is chemotherapy used to stabilize uh, this kind of disease. It does not make tumors grow smaller, as you have seen here. And this patient uh, had his metastases remain small for about a year until his ascorbic acid was stopped by his oncologist. Other effects of ascorbic acid um, have been reported recently from the University of Kansas group on patients with ovarian cancer, and their um, side effects, adverse events, were, were quite a bit reduced in patients who received ascorbic acid along with their chemo. These are patients who were treated with IV ascorbic acid for at least a year. And these data also, again, uh, indicate that this material is, is very safe. So what we can conclude from this really accidental discovery about pharmacologic ascorbic acid uh, in cancer treatment is that intravenous ascorbic acid produces plasma concentrations several hundred times higher than those possible from oral administration. Only intravenous ascorbic acid works to do this. Pharmacologic ascorbic acid concentrations kill cancer cells, but not normal cells. The mechanism is by generating extracellular hydrogen peroxide. In animal models, there is a reduction of tumor growth of aggressive tumor types. That pharmacologic ascorbic acid seems to act synergistically with at least some kinds of cancer chemotherapeutic agents and does not seem to cause harm or adverse events with those agents. That pharmacologic ascorbic acid to people is surprisingly safe. Um, that uh, there are promising data from phase one studies that there are, there are um, durable effects in patients. The key next steps are clinical studies that are phase two type with longer duration of treatment. At least 12 to 16 weeks of treatment is needed to see a response. We really need more patients and more trials. And ideally, these uh, administration of the agent should be blinded. So the original work that I described to you was to think about uh, concentration function relationships. If we now add in ascorbic acid as a drug, we see in the middle of this curve that millimolar or pharmacologic concentrations can produce peroxide as a prodrug, which may be very useful for cancer treatment. The concepts of concentration function are still very valid. They're squeezed here on the left side of this graph simply to indicate the different kinds of concentrations that drive these reactions, either physiologic on the left or pharmacologic on the right. These studies could not have occurred without the research subjects who literally gave themselves to live in the hospital for up to six months. Um, I'm very grateful for all the members of my laboratory, past and present, who have been with me, and that this work could be done in the intramural research program at the National Institutes of Health, uh, where there is value for translational research. The clinical center, staff at the clinical center, my collaborators at different universities, all important, and the Marcus Foundation, who supported um, one of the cancer trials at Thomas Jefferson, and in fact is funding a pro metastatic prostate double-blinded cancer trial right now at Johns Hopkins Hospital. I leave you with this thought from the person who isolated uh, vitamin C as the anti-scorbutic factor, and I thank you for listening.